Again. Hello, brethren and friends. Pleasant greetings. Welcome once again to present Truth to SDA and Sabbath School Discussion. With me is Sister Cherry and Brother Brian, and I'm Sister Aiken. And we are here to take you through lesson four of the book of Mark. And this week's lesson is titled Parables. We trust that you have had a good week and that you are happy to be back to share with us. But before we go further, Brother Brian will give us the opening prayer. Thank you very much, Sister Aiken. All of it, Father, we thank you that we're able to gather here again virtually to go through this week's lesson. We ask that you guide us by your spirit and help us to bring out only those things which you wish to reveal to us and to your people for our own blessing. Have your own way, we ask, and grant us open ears and receptive hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Brother Brian. So we'll turn the page and look at the scriptures that we've got studying for this week. And we have Mark 4, 1 to 34, James 1, 21, Isaiah 6, 1 to 13, Psalm 104, 12, Daniel 4, 10 to 12, and the memory text is Mark 4, 24 and 25. And it says, And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath to him shall be given. And he that hath not from him shall be taken, even that which he hath. And the lesson says, for many years, scholars have argued over the meaning and interpretation of Jesus' parables. How to interpret what they mean, why Jesus used them, what kind of lessons they were intended to reveal, and how literally they were to be taken, or whether they were purely allegory, and so forth. Now, before we go further, before we look at the memory text, we want to ask the question, what are parables? And so we'll turn the page to find out what inspiration says. For those of us who have been to the old school, of when they used to teach Bible knowledge in school, we have learned that a parable is an earthly story with an heavenly meaning. Now, is that what the Bible teach? Let's hear from inspiration exactly what it says. And we'll read from Christ's object lesson, page 17 and paragraph 2, and it says, Natural things were the medium for the spiritual. The things of nature and the life experience of his hearers were connected with the truths of the written word, leading thus from the natural to the spiritual kingdom. Jesus, leading thus from the natural to the spiritual kingdom, Christ Parables are links in the chain of truth that unites man with God and earth with heaven. So we hear what the parables are. They are links in the chain of truth that unites man with God and earth with heaven. So we'll move forward and look at how inspiration explains the memory text. And remember the memory text, we read it again, Mark 4, 24 and 25. And it says, And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath, to him shall be given. And he that hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he hath. And I have always wondered, if I have nothing, how can that be taken away from me? Well, as we get into the details from inspiration, we'll understand more. So we'll read from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 694, paragraph 3. And it says, The Savior bade his disciples, Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. And he speaks of a certain class that hear and will not understand, lest they should be converted and be healed. Again he said, Take heed what ye hear. He that is of God heareth God's words. So we are told to take heed what we hear. And the reason too for that is because there are false prophets out there. 
And sometimes we hear the things that we want to hear. As we get deeper into the lesson, we'll see how that is possible. So let's move forward and get into some more details. So inspiration continues from volume five, page 694. Four. Those who listened to the words of Christ heard and reported his teaching just according to the spirit that was in them. So if we have a spirit that does not want to hear reproof, we're not going to be hearing reproof. Will we? No. If we have the spirit of Satan, we're going to hear what Satan is saying to us. But we, if we have the spirit of Christ, then we will hear what Christ says. So let's continue. It is ever thus with those who hear God's word. The manner in which they understand and receive it depends upon the spirit which dwells in their hearts. Continuing, there are many who put their own construction upon what they hear, making the thought appear altogether different from that which the speaker endeavored to express. Some hearing through the medium of their own prejudices or predisposition understand the matter as they desire it to be. And as we get deeper into the lessons, we will see that this is the situation with the Jewish people. As a matter of fact, last week's lesson, we saw some examples of this very same thing. So inspiration continues. As will best to... All right, let me read that again. Some hearing through the medium of their own prejudices or predisposition understand the matter as they desire it to be, as will be best sorry, as will best suit their purpose and so report it. So they hear whatever it is they want to hear as it will suit their purpose and that is how they will report it. Following the promptings of an unsanctified heart, they construe into evil that which rightly understood might be a means of great good. So this is very clear. We hear what we want to hear because it is right up our sleeve of thought and we run along with it and we cast a shadow on the truth. Let's move forward and hear what more inspiration has to tell us concerning this matter. So Jesus taught an avenue to every heart. By using a variety of illustrations, he not only presented truth in its different phases, but appealed to the different hearers. Their interest was aroused by figures drawn from the surroundings of their daily life. None who listened to the Savior could feel that they were neglected or forgotten. The humblest, the most sinful, heard in his teaching a voice that spoke to them in sympathy and tenderness. Christ Object Lesson 21, Paragraph 2. And continuing from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, 696, we read again, before we get there, we read from Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 236. In parables and comparisons, he found the best method of communicating divine truth. Continuing with five testimony. And now, to all who have a desire for truth, I would say, do not give credence to unauthenticated reports as to what Sister White has done or said or written. And this is a solemn counsel to us. If you desire to know what the Lord has revealed through her, read her, read her published works. So, remember, brethren, we could also say here, if we desire to know the truth for ourselves, study the word of God. This is exactly what it is saying. And we learned a few quarters ago that the word, the written word is Jesus, and we need to have an experience experience of Jesus for ourselves. So we cannot wait on someone to report to us what Jesus is like. We have to learn by studying his word and practicing what we learn from his word to know who Jesus is. So we continue with this reading. Sister White is admonishing us. If you desire to know what the Lord has revealed through her, read her published works. Are there any points of interest concerning which she has not written? Do not eagerly catch up and report rumors as to what she has said. So, this is a serious and solemn admonition for us to contemplate. 
You want to know the truth? I want to know the truth. Study the word for ourselves. I hope we get that clearly. So let's move forward. So the Savior's promise, whosoever hath to him shall be given, applies also to the reception of truth. To him who seeks to understand its teachings will be given increased understanding. Yes, because Jesus said on the mountain, he who hungers and thirsts for righteousness shall be filled. So to him who re reveals that he possesses the spirit of truth will be given a larger measure of the spirit that he may work out his own salvation. The work of reflecting Christ to the world will not be done boastingly, but in fear and trembling, yet in the power of the spirit, counsels to parents, teachers, and students. So as we get into this week's lesson, we'll be looking at the reason of existing of parables. The parables of the sower, the sower went out to sow. We'll also see the explanation of the parable. We'll see other parables too, the lamp and the measurement, growth and mustard seed. So now from here we run, we go into Sunday's lesson and Brother Brian will take us to Brother Brian, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Aiken. Sunday's lesson deals with the parable of the sower. And we're given Mark 4, verse 1 to 9 to read. Let's get, a, get on to it and then look at our question. All right, Betty, let's look at the question first. It asks, what are the different soils like and what happens to the seed that falls on them? So Mark 4, verse 1 to 9 says, And he began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, and we know this is Jesus, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, they went out a sword to sow, and it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. Here we see the first child being spoken about here. We ask what are different sides like. It says some fell by the wayside. So some fell on the side by the, the side of the, the way, the road. And the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground. Soil with a lot of stones in it. Where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some thing fell among thorns, some fell on tiny soil. And the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, good nourishing soil for plants to grow well. And did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty and some sixty, and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that asks ears to hear, let him hear. But that very solemn description of the different soils and their composition. Let's continue and get the lesson that Christ wishes to reveal to us from it. The inspiration says, He that sowed the good seed is the son of man. Christ had come not as a king, but as a sower. Not for the overthrow of kingdoms, but for the scattering of seed. Not to point his followers to earthly triumphs and national greatness, but to a harvest to be gathered after patient toil and through losses and disappointments. So it says Christ had come as a sower in this parable. He described it as a sower. To sow the word of God among the nations of the earth. Let's continue. So the word of God is the seed. Every seed has in itself a germinating principle. In it, the life of the plant is enfolded. So, so there is life in God's word. Christ says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that hath that sent me, hath everlasting life. 
So like a sower in the field, he came to scatter the heavenly grain of truth. And his parable teaching it, and his parable teaching itself, and his parable teaching itself was the seed with which the most precious truths of his grace were sown. Because of its simplicity, the parable of the sower has not been valued as it should be. So because it seems so simple and practical, the lesson that it's, it's meant to convey has not been valued as it should be valued. From the natural seed cast into the soil, and cast into the soil, Christ desires to lead our minds to the gospel seed, his words of life, the sowing of which results in bringing man back to his loyalty to God. He who gave the parable of the tiny seed is the sovereign of heaven, and the same laws that govern earthly seeds so in govern the sowing of the seeds of truth. So this also gives us a pattern in which we have to work, and all the gospel, the gospel truth is sown among different persons in different hearts. Let's continue. So that which, with which the parable of the sower chiefly deals is the effect produced and the growth of the seed by the soil into which it is cast. By this parable, Christ was virtually saying to his hearers, it is not safe for you to stand as critics of my work or to indulge disappointment because it does not meet your ideas. The question of greatest importance to you is, how do you treat my message? Upon your reception or rejection of, rejection of it, your eternal destiny depends. And it's the very same with the gospel work today. It, de it decides the eternal destiny of souls, whether they reject or accept it. Throughout the parable of the soul, Christ represents the different results of the sowing as depending upon the soil. So it's the soil of the human heart. In every case, the sower and the seed are the same. Thus, he teaches that if the word of God fails of, of accomplish, accomplishing its work in our hearts and lives, the reason is to be found in ourselves. Certainly, the reason could not be the word of God, because the word of God is true and sure. But the result is not beyond our control. True, we cannot change ourselves, but the power of the choice is ours, and it rests with us to determine what we will become. Inspiration has another statement where it says, what we are what we are to become, we are now becoming. So actions and life as we live them today in this very moment are deciding our future life and our eternal destiny. And so we have a choice to decide whether which which sort of style we are to receive the word of God. Let's continue. So the garden of the heart must be cultivated. The soil must be broken up by deep repentance for a sin. This is creating the analogy of the practical work of sowing, this, sowing the seed in the soil. Poisonous satanic plants must be uprooted. And we, we can call to mind the work of the farmer before planting his crops. He has to plow the soil, break up the soil and uproot the weeds that will choke the, 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 the plant that is being planted. The soil once overgrown by thorns can be reclaimed only by diligent labor, working hard to get rid of all of them. So the evil tendencies of the heart can be overcome only by earnest effort in the name and strength of Jesus. The Lord bids us by his prophet, break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. This work he desires to accomplish for us, and he asks us to cooperate with him. So here we see we are not to worry about the work that we, we have needs to be done for us. He, Christ, desires to accomplish it for us, and he's asking us to yield to him, to cooperate with him, so that he can accomplish that work in our hearts and our lives. The sowers of the seed have a work to do in preparing hearts to receive the gospel. This is us now who are sharing the words of life to others. In the ministry of the word, there is too much sermonizing 
and too little of real heart to heart work. And if I may add the most important heart to heart work for us is to show a practical example of the truth, making changes in our very own in our very own hearts and lives, so that persons can see what the truth has done and be drawn to Christ and his words of life. There is need of personal labor for the souls of the lost. In Christ-like sympathy, we should come close to men individually and seek to awaken their interest in the great things of eternal life. Their hearts may be as hard as the beaten highway, and apparently it may be a useless effort to present the Savior to them. But, but, but while logic may fail to move, and argument be powerless to convince, the love of Christ revealed in personal ministry may soften the stony heart so that the seed of truth can take root. So the, although the parable of the sower and the seed speaks about this, the different soils and uh, the outcome of the seed when it is sown in them, us sowing the work of us doing the gospel work nowadays, just as the literal farm have a work to do, we can remove all those turns and do work that will be effective in breaking up the, the stony soils, the stony hearts, so that they may be prepared for the seed of truth. And so a stony heart or a soil overcome with, with turns should not deter us, knowing that we can, if we cooperate with Christ and follow his methods, still reach those hearts and win them to his kingdom. So may God help me and help us to understand the importance of these things and the work that he asks us to do in this regard. Back over to you, Sister Aiken. Thank you very much, Brother Brian, for so ably taking us through Sunday's lesson. And our viewers will notice that we did not get deep into the matter of the soil because it will come out on the Monday's lesson, the type of soil. So all that is in the explanation or the interpretation of Jesus' words, which could not be separated at all from the, the, in the, the soil, the type of soil, it the explanation could not be separated from the interpretation which Jesus gave. So we'll hear about it on Monday's lesson. And Sister Cherry will take us through. Sister Cherry. Thank you very much, Sister Akin. So we are going to go more into the interpretation as to what Jesus really meant. But Brian brought out for us how the work of the soil is done and who sowed the seed of the soil. So we are going to look at verses 13 to 20 of Mark chapter 4. And it says, how did Jesus interpret the parable of the sower? So let us go forward. We're going to read verses 13 to 20, but then we're going to take a look at the different soils that were sown. It says... And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable, and how then will ye know all parables? The sower soweth the word, and these are they, and these are they by the wayside, sorry, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which have sown on stony grounds who when they have heard the word, immediately received it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure for, but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth, for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the loss of other things enter entering in, choke the word, and it become unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring it forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, and some a hundredfold. So we we are going to look at 
the different soils that were sown. We're going to look at the stony ground. We're going to look at the, the tawny ground. We are going to look at the, the ground that is fruitful, right? That good ground. Right. And we're going to look at those that fell by the wayside. So the first one we're going to look at is those that fell at the wayside. We are told from Christ's object lessons what those by the wayside really mean a deeper understanding of them. It says they represent the, the seed so by the wayside represent the word of God as it falls upon the heart of an inattentive hearer. Like the hard beaten path trodden down by the feet of men and beasts is the heart that becomes a highway for the world's traffic its pleasures and sins, absorbed in selfish aims and sinful indulgences. The soul is hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. According to Hebrews 3.13, the spiritual faculties are paralyzed. Men hear the word but understand it not. They do not discern that it applies to themselves. They do not realize their need of, of their danger or the danger they do not perceive the love of Christ and they pass by the message of his grace as something that does not concern them. So they hear the, they hear the word, but they, they have not paid much attention to it. The things of the world have observed them. Selfishness, indulgences, they're paralyzed to the things of, of God. And because of that, they do not take it seriously and they pass by it as something that doesn't really concern them. What does that have to do with me? Right? So observing selfishness, selfish aims and sinful indulgences, the soul is hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. The spiritual faculties, as we read, are paralyzed. Men hear the word, but they, are, they don't understand it. They do not discern that it applies to themselves. They do not realize their need or their danger. They do not perceive the love of Christ. And they pass by the message of his grace as something that does not concern them. So we are looking, we are continuing to look at the wayside. Inspiration says, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in the heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. It was snatched away. Because guess why? Guess what, why was it snatched away? Because it didn't fall on that good soil. It fall by the wayside. They do not understand. That when, and, and that is very important for us to have an understanding of the truth. Because when we understand the truth and we we allow it to take root in our heart. Nobody can snatch that away from us. It says, what can separate us from the love of God? Nothing can separate us. So we're going to look at the stony places, the stony ground. He that received the seed into the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word and anon it with joy. Receive it, yet had he not root in himself, but Draw it for a while, for when tribulation or persecution arises, because of the word, by and by he is offended. So we are seeing those that are on these stony places, because we look at the wayside, and we are seeing those at the stony place, it is not going to endure persecution. They're going to be offended for the truth's sake. So the seed up on stony ground finds little depth of soil. The plant springs up quickly, but the root cannot penetrate the rocks as shown in the picture here. The root cannot go deep enough to hold that plant for it to penetrate and take root. So the plant springs up quickly, but the root cannot penetrate the rock to find Nutriment to sustain its growth. As it soon perishes, many 
it says, who make a profession of religion as stony ground hearers. Like the rock underlying the lay of the earth, the selfishness of the natural heart underlies the soil of their good desire and aspiration. Unlike those of the wayside, those of the wayside believe that it doesn't concern them. But these who are on the stony ground, it says the selfishness of the natural heart underlies the soil of their good desire and aspiration. So they have an aspiration and, and for the truth. They have good intentions for the truth. But what lies in the natural heart oftentimes take that away. And that's where most Christians fall in. It says the love of self is not subdued. They have not seen the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And the heart has not been humbled on the sense of its guilt. This class may be easily convinced and appear to be bright converts, but they are only a super they only have a superficial religion. You see? It is not because men receive the word immediately, nor because they rejoice in it, that they fall away. As soon as Matthew heard the Savior's call, immediately he rose up, left all, and followed him. And as, as soon as the divine word comes to our heart, God desires us to receive it. And it is right to accept it with joy. Joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repented. So they are different. We see the different soil in which the seed is sown. But when that seed is sown in a heart that rejoices for the truth, there is joy in heaven over that one repentant sinner. Not, a, not one superficial person who appears to be a convert because the Lord knows the heart. One who truly repents of his sins. In the thorns that choke the good seed, the great teacher would depict the dangers that are around those who hear the word of God. For there are falls on every hand, right? To make of no effect the precious truth of God. All that draws the affection from God must be renounced if the seed of truth is to flourish in the soul. Jesus specified the things that are dangerous to the soul. He says the cares of the world and the deceitful method of riches and the and the desire for other things. Choke the word. The growing spiritual seed. So that the soul does not draw nourishment from Christ. As does the branch from the vine. And the spiritual life dies from the heart. Love of the world. Love of its pleasure and display. And love of other things. Keep the soul away from God. For he who loves the world. Does not depend upon God for his courage his hope, his joy. He knows not what it is to have the joy of Christ, but this is the joy of leading others to the fountain of life, of winning souls from sin to righteousness. And this is what we want. But those who have that thorny, those that, have fought, that fell on thorny ground, the things of the world consumes them. And that we see that most of the other soul, other soil have similarities. The things of the world are one of our biggest problems. The desire to be rich, the desire to acquire. While having riches is not a sin, while having other things is not a sin, what takes first preference in the heart? And that is shown through the different soil. So we are going to look at the good ground. So the good ground hearers receive the word, not as the word of men, but as it is as it is in truth. So the good ground hearers, when they receive the word, they don't see it as men. And oftentimes, a lot of persons see the word of God as man's doing. We see inspiration, the writing that comes from, from Sister White. 
and all the other inspired writings that were given to us. We see them as men's doing, but those who have the seed falling on the good ground don't see these as men's word. They see these as the word of God. It says, Only he who received the scriptures as the voice of God speaking to himself is a true learner. He trembles at the word, for to him it is a living reality. He opens his understanding and his heart receives it. Such hearers were Cornelius and his friends, who said to the apostle Peter, Now therefore are we all here pre present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Acts 10, 33. The Soa, inspiration tells us, is not always to meet with disappointment. Of the seed that fell into the ground, the Savior said, this is he that heareth the word, he understands it, and not only that, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some 34, that on the good grounds are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word of God, keep it and bring it forth fruit with patience. And this we can answer the last question with. On the Monday, that personal question, what is it doing for us? Because all these different soils, right? You see that there are different soils that the seed was sown in. But you do not have to remain a stony ground here or a someone thorny. Sometimes that happens where we are picked off, but another opportunity is always given us. Christ has always given us an opportunity to make it into the kingdom of God. So we are going to stay here on the Monday and hand to go back to Sister Akins. So, so while I'm handing over to Sister Akins, while she's coming, reading from the book, A Call to Stand Apart, Inspiration says, this is page 23, paragraph 4, the wayside, the stony ground, the thorny ground hearers need not remain such. The Spirit of God is ever seeking to break the spell off of infatuation that holds men observing worldly things and to await men desire for the imperishable treasure. So we may start off as Tony Brown heroes, we may start off as, as those of Tony, or we may start off as those as fell at the wayside. But we need not stay there and think that this is it. Well, here I am, I cannot do anything better. An opportunity is always given us. Go ahead, Sister Aiken. Thank you very much, Sister Cherry. You have brought us beautifully through, through Monday's lesson and those various different types of soils or hard condition in which the seed falls. Now, I like this one about the good grown hearer. <clears throat> Sorry. And my prayer is that we'll all be good grown hearers. And inspiration says, but the good grown hearer, the good grown hearers, having heard the word, keep it. Satan, with all his agencies of evil, is not able to catch it away. So I pray that we'll be this, these are this type of here, the good grown hearers who buy the truth and sell it not. Now we'll move into Tuesday's lesson, and Brother Brian will take us through. Thank you, Reverend Sister Aiken. Tuesday's lesson speaks about the reason for the parables. So I have to read back 4, verse 10 to 12. Let's continue. So based on Mark 4, verse 10 to 12, we're asked, why did Jesus teach in parables? And it says that when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted 
and your sins should be forgiven. So Jesus desired to awaken inquiry. He sought to arouse the careless and impress truth upon the heart. Parable teaching was popular and commanded the respect and attention not only of the Jews, but of the people of other nations. No more effective method of instruction could he have implied. If his hearers had desired a knowledge of divine things, they might have understood his word, for he was always willing to explain them to the honest inquirer. So here we see here Christ told the parables another reason why he told them was to arouse inquiry so that a person would come to him and ask him for the meaning of his words, that he could reveal it to them. Let's continue. Jesus had another reason for, reason for teaching in parables. Among the multitudes that gathered about him, there were priests and rabbis, scribes and elders, Herodians and rulers, world-loving, bigoted, ambitious men, who desired above all things to find some accusation against him. Their spies followed his steps day after day to catch from his lips something that would cause his condemnation and forever silence the one who seemed to draw the world after him. The Savior understood the character of these men, and he presented truth in such a way that they could find nothing by which to bring his case before the Sanhedrin. In parables, he rebuked the hypocrisy and wicked works of those who occupied high positions, and in figurative language clothed, clothed truth of so cut in a character that had it, been, had it been spoken in direct denunciation, they would not have listened to his words and would speedily have put an end to his ministry. But while he evaded the spies, he made truth so clear that error was manifested and the honest in heart were profited by his lessons. So he spoke in parables as well to evade the spies who wanted to catch some plain word from his lips to use and accuse him and to prosecute him and end his ministry. They could not find anything objectionable in his parables for he was speaking of things that they knew as common happenings in everyday life. And the stories they could tell were true. And the application that was made of them, they could not again say or say it was false. Let's continue. In the earlier part of his ministry, Christ had spoken to the people in words so plain that all his hearers might have grasped truth which would make them wise unto salvation. But in many hearts, the truth had taken no root and it had been quickly caught away. Therefore speak I to them in parables, he said, because they see not and hearing, because, because, they seen, see, because they seen, see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their, high, their eyes they have closed. So Christ's plain words were of no effect upon them. So he sought to use parables as a more effective means of reaching those whom he wanted to reach with eternal truth. Let's continue and gain some more thoughts on the lesson. It says, Jesus taught by illustrations and parables drawn from nature and from the familiar events of everyday life. The inspired record says, All these things speak Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable speak he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. In this way, he, has, he associated natural things with spiritual, linking the things of nature and the life experience of his hearers with the sublime spiritual truths of the written word. And his lessons were repeated whenever their eyes rested on the objects which had been, which had been associated with eternal truth. And we may think how wonderful the wisdom of Christ is. Because the easiest way for us to remember something is to 
tied to something else with which we are familiar. He who made man's mind knew this and knew how to bring forward his truth in such a way that it will reach the very hearts and minds of men, using wisdom and tact that only he could employ in his work. Let's continue. So according to Isaiah 6, verse 1 to 13, what happens to Isaiah here and what is the message he is given to take to Israel? So verse 1 says, in the, year that, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above, above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly, and one cried unto another and said, Holy, 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 holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongues of, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, here I am, send me. So here we see the illustration of what happened to Isaiah. It says it was in the year that King Uzziah died. <clears throat> he said he saw the Lord high and lifted up. Sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. And he saw the angels. And we can read the whole uh, event and and clearly see what what clearly see in detail what took place with Isaiah there as we are familiar with it. Let's also go into the message he was given to bear. Message he was given to the message he was given to bear to Israel. Let's continue. And he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. This is the Lord speaking to Isaiah, telling him what his message would entail. Then said I, this is Isaiah now, Lord, O long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. <clears throat> and the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaken, and there be a great forsaken in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tent, and it shall return, and shall be eaten as a tail tree and as an oak whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves, so the holy seeds shall be the substance thereof. So inspiration says that their illumination was genuine, as the contrast between humanity and the divine character was made plain to him. He felt altogether inefficient and unworthy. How could he speak to the people the holy requirements of Jehovah? So this is why Isaiah was saying he's a man of unclean lips and he dwells amongst a people of unclean lips. But we know that God fit him for service and used him to do a mighty work of preaching the truths that he needed to bring to the people in that time. And these truths are even coming down to our day in the end of times and have even greater 
importance to us. Let's continue. Inspiration says, oh, how many who are engaged in this work of responsibility need to behold God as did Isaiah. For in the presence of his glory and majesty, self will sink, sink into nothingness. The inspiration is saying, if we behold God as Isaiah beheld him in all his majesty, self will, in all his glory and majesty, self will sink into nothingness. So we will not continue to look at self and all the reproaches that fall upon us. We will count it all joy to suffer all things for Christ, seeing the wonderful glory of the Lord and its uh, matchless majesty. As, God, as God's ministers look by faith into the Holy of Holies and see the work of our great high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, they realize that they are men of unclean lips, Men whose tongues have often spoken vanity. Well, well may they despair as they contrast their own unworthiness with the perfection of Christ. This is the mind and heart that we are to have. If we truly have a full re revelation of the glory of Christ. With contrition of art, feeling holy and worthy and unfit for their great work. They cry, I am undone. But... If, but if, like Isaiah, they humble their heart before God, the work done for the prophet will be performed for them. This is a wonderful promise. If we, like Isaiah, open humble our heart before God, the work that was done for Isaiah will be done for us as well. Their lips will be touched with a live coal from off the altar, and they will lose sight of self in a sense of the greatness and power of God and his readiness to help them. They will realize the sacredness of the work entrusted to them and will be led to abort everything that would cause them to dishonor him who has sent them forth with his message. So this is very solemn. If we have a revelation of God as Isaiah, as it was revealed to Isaiah, and have a true sense of our own unworthiness, we will learn to lay self aside all our petty disputes and grievances and look wholly to Christ, seeking to do his will, relying on the strength that only he alone can impart. He says, without me, he can do nothing. But scripture also says in another place that I can do all things through Christ with strength in me. So when we realize our nothingness, unless we are connected with him, unless we have his help, his guidance every step of the way, then we will truly have that experience that Isaiah had and be fitted to do a work that will be even greater than Isaiah did, knowing that we are living in a, in a, more, in a much more advanced season. So may God help me and help us to realize all these things and the need to humble our hearts before God that he may fit us for service and help us to effectively carry forward his work of the gospel in the world. I end here on Tuesday's lesson and hand over back to Sister Aiken. Thank you very much, Brother Brian. Very well put together. So we need to die to self. We need to see ourselves as nothing in the sight of God. But in, we, when we look at the Jewish people, they think they were something when they were actually nothing. And it is the reason why they ended up crucifying their Lord, for he came to make them see, but they thought they were seeing, so they remained blind. May this not be us, brethren, as Sister Cherry took us through Wednesday's lesson. Thank you very much, Sister Higgins. So we are looking at lamp and measuring basket. This is based on verses 21 to 25. So let's look at it. Let's read. I like reading the word of God. And he said unto me, Is a candle brought to be put on a 
bushel o under bill. And not to be set on a candlestick. Let me read that again. And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel on, or under a bed, and not to be set on a candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall not be made, that shall not be manifest. Neither was anything kept secret, but that it is, but that it should come abroad. If any man have ears, let him hear. So there is a candle. Where do you put it? Do you put it on the bushel? Cover it up? Do you put it on the bed? Or do you set it up on a candlestick so that it could give light to everything? Jesus used the light of a candle to represent his doctrine, which illuminates the soul of those who accept them. This light is not to be hidden from the world, but should shine forth to enlighten and bless those who behold it. The instruction received by those who listened to Jesus was to be communicated by them to others and thus handed down to posterity. He also declared that there, is, there was nothing hidden that should not be manifested. Whatever was in the heart would sooner or later be revealed by the actions. And these would determine whether the seed sown had taken root in their minds and born goodly fruit, or whether the thorns and brambles had won the day. This is deep. The Savior looks upon the company before him, and then to the rising sun, and said to his disciples, Ye are the light of the world, as the sun goes forth on its errand of love, dispelling the shades of night and awakening the world to life, so the followers of Christ are to go forth on their mission, diffusing the light of heaven upon those who are in darkness of error and sin. In the brilliant light of the morning, the towns and villages upon the surrounding hills stood forth clearly, making an attractive feature of, of scene, pointing to them Jesus, Said, a city set on a hill cannot be hid. And he added, Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it shineth unto all that is in the house. Most of those who listened to the, most of those who listened to the words of Jesus were peasants and fishermen who lowly shone, who lowly dwell in sorry, contain but one room. So that's why the illustration of the light, the candle, stick, and the lamp, they can relate to it. Because it's about just one room, once they put that candle lit, it will shine everywhere in the house. It continues to say, Even so said Jesus, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. Verses 24 and 25. The question is asked, what is Jesus conveying in the parable of the measuring basket? So let's take a look at it. And he said unto them, take heed what you hear. With what measure you met, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that had, to him shall be given. And he that had not, from him shall be taken even that which he had. What does this remind? This remind you of the, the talent. The one who had one talent, who took it and buried it. That was given to the one that had five, right? Now, this is inspiration explaining to us what it means. And with what measure of sincere attention they listen to his instruction they would receive like measure of knowledge in return. All who truly desire to understand his doctrine would be fully satisfied. Their heaven-given privilege would increase. Their light would brighten unto the perfect day. But those who did not desire the light of truth 
would grow up in darkness and be overcome by the powerful temptations of Satan. They would lose their dignity and self-control and the little knowledge of which they had boasted when they declared that they had need of Christ, no need of Christ, and scorn the guidance of him who left a throne in heaven to save them. The measure of the earnestness with which you hear my word, that may help others, will be the measure by which a knowledge of this word is given to you. To him who listens intently shall be given, for God sees that he will use his knowledge aright. From him who has not to improve his opportunities, who has not practiced the truth, that others may share the blessing of his knowledge, shall be taken away, even that which he has. His opportunity to be all that God designed him to be, receiving and imparting the light of heaven, shall be taken away from him. And it, it's, it sounds really sad when you hear it. But it is the reality if we do not perceive the truth. If we do not allow it to take root in our heart, this is going to be the reality. Take heed, therefore, how you hear it, is an admonition of Christ. We are to hear for the sake of learning the truth that we may walk in it. And again, take heed what you hear. Examine closely. Prove all things. Believe not every spirit. But try the spirit whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. This is the counsel of God. Shall we heed it? That's a question for you and I. So we stop here right on the Wednesday with that question for us to ponder in our heart. Shall we heed it? As I hand over to Sister Akins. Thank you very much, Sister Cherry, for so ably taking us through Wednesday. So now we'll move on to Thursday. And Thursday's topic, parables of growing seed. And we have Mark 4, 26 to 29. What is the primary focus of this parable? And we'll also look at Mark 4, 30 to 32. What is the important stress of the parable of the mustard seed? So let's turn the pages and get right into it. Reading Mark 4, 26 to 29. And it says, And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep, and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, First the blade, then the air, after that the full corn in the air. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. So what does this mean? What does inspiration say? Let's read from Spirit of Prophecy, volume 2, page 243, paragraph 3. And it says, The seed here spoken of is the word of God sown in the heart and made fruitful by divine grace. If the truth takes root in the heart, it will sooner or later spring into life and bear fruit. The life and character will show the nature and quantity of the seed sown. But the work of cultivating is the work of a lifetime. The principles of truth once planted in the soul are to be carried out in the daily duties of life. The growth of Christian character is gradual, like the advancement of the natural plant through its various stages of development. But nevertheless, the progress is continual. As in nature, so it is in grace. The plant must either grow or die. So there is no stopping point. The plant must continue to grow. And this process is also called sanctification. Let's read the next. Let's turn the page and read the next statement so that we can understand a little bit more concerning this. And it says, Day by day, the sanctifying influence of the Spirit of God, almost imperceptibly, leads those who love the ways of truth toward the perfection of righteousness, till finally the soul is ripe for the harvest, the life work is ended, God gathers in his grain. There is no period in the Christian life when there is no more to learn, 
no higher attainments to reach, not at all. As long as we are alive, we'll be growing. There is much more to learn. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. First the blade, then the air, then the full corn in the air, then the ripening and the harvest. For when the fruit is perfect, it is ready for the sickle. So repetition in and pause the mind and inspiration has given us given us given it to us twice and we need to ponder these things carefully so let's move forward and get into some more details so inspiration says continuing from spirit of prophecy volume 2 page 245 245 paragraph 1 this figure presented a most marked contrast to the condition of the Jews. Their religion was cold and formal. The Holy Spirit had no place in their hearts. Therefore, instead of growing in grace and advancing in the knowledge of God, they were continually becoming more callous and begotted, retreating farther and farther from the presence of the Lord. And this is really very sad, brethren. But we need to stop here and ponder their situation. We need to contemplate the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, and it says, Now all these things happen unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. The word ensample there means type. So they are the type and we are the anti-type. Their story tells what will happen to us. Let's go forward and get some insight from inspiration concerning this particular verse of scripture and the life of ancient Israel. Inspiration says, the apostle Paul plainly states that the experience of the Israelites in their travels has been recorded for the benefit of those living in this age of the world, those upon whom the ends of the world are come. And this does not mean the unbelievers out in the world or the other Christians out there so much, but us Seventh-day Adventists, we are God's people today. We do not consider that our dangers are any less than those of the Hebrews, inspiration continues, but greater. So we have greater dangers to face than they had. After all, Satan has been practicing for over 6,000 years and we are the last generation. So our dangers must be greater. Inspiration continues, there will be temptations to jealousies and murmurings, and there will be outspoken rebellion as are recorded of ancient Israel. There will ever be a spirit to rise up against the reproof of sins and wrongs. But shall the voice of reproof be hushed because of this? If so, we shall be in no better situation than are, than are the various denominations in our land who are afraid to touch the errors and prevailing sins of the people. So here in Testimonies, volume 3, page 358, paragraph 2, inspiration is telling us clearly that we are the people living in these last days. And if we are afraid to speak the truth, we are no better than the, the other denominations, the various denominations out there. So my brethren, I pray that we will ponder these things and not be as callous, and as, as, as rebellious as ancient Israel. For let's move forward and read what more inspiration says. Inspiration says, continue, continuing from volume three, Satan's snares are laid for us verily, as verily as they were laid for the children of Israel just prior to their entrance into the land of Canaan. We are repeating the history of that people. Did we hear that, brethren? Inspiration did not say we may repeat a probability or that we will repeat a future event, but inspiration says we are repeating the history of that people. Present tense, that's our condition today. Repeating the, the, the condition of ancient Israel, repeating their history, being as rebellious and as callous as they were. Now we need to search our own hearts. Each of us need to search our own hearts for Jesus speaks the truth at all times. So we need to search our hearts and make restitution before it becomes eternally too late. Inspiration continues to say, 
The same disobedience and failure which were seen in the Jewish church have characterized in a greater degree the people who have had this great light from heaven in the last messages of warning. The last messages of warning, we find them in Revelation 14, 6 to 12, the three angels' messages. Shall we like them squander our opportunities? This is, shall we like ancient Israel squander our opportunities and privileges until God shall permit oppression and persecution to come upon us? I pray not. I pray that by God's grace we'll make our wrongs right. Will the work which might be performed in peace and comparative prosperity be left undone until it must be performed in days of darkness under the pressure of trial and persecution? No, may God forbid that such a thing should be. Brethren, these lessons have come at an opportune time, and I pray that we will not be as, as rebellious as ancient Israel, but there's a place in inspiration that says we have done worse than they. Volume 1, I think, page 129. Let's move forward. What we have seen here is enough to make us stop and think and search our own hearts. And inspiration continues to say, and this, these next two statements will show us the relation between these two parables, the growing seed and the mustard seed. Inspiration says from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, the proud cavalling Pharisees looked around upon the vast numbers gathered to hear Jesus and noted contemptuously how few there were who acknowledged him as the Messiah. So they thought that God was particular about quantity, but God is looking for quality. If there is only one converted sinner, God is happy. He would be happier if the five or the billions of people around the world would become converted. But if there is only one, he is happy. Happier to have one converted more than several hypocrites. So inspiration continues, there were many educated and influential men who had come to hear the prophet whose fame had spread far and near. Some of these looked with curious interest upon the throng, which was composed of all classes of society and every nationality. They were the poor, the illiterate, the rugged beggar, the robber with the seal of guilt upon his face, the sick, the maimed, the dissipated, high and low, rich and humble, jostling each other for a place to stand and hear the words of Jesus. So these, the, the untoward, or the outcast, the despised by the Jewish nation, these, the poor, the dissipated, the maimed, they were hungrily and thirstily striving or drawing closer to hear the truths that fell from Jesus' mouth, to receive the seed, while the doctors and the influentials the Pharisees looked on with scorn, rejecting the precious seed that was falling. I pray this will not be any of us. Let's go to the next step, the next page. I pray we'll be among the class who are hungering and thirsting, the poor, the maimed, and such. So as they gaze, they ask themselves incredulously, is the kingdom of God composed of such material as this? And they were talking about the poor, those who were listening, the maimed, the sick, the thief. Jesus read their thoughts and replied to them by another parable. So here's the reason why the parable of the mustard seed was given. So let's read Mark 4, 32 to 32. And it says, and he said, Whereunto shall we like the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs and shooteth out great branches so that the folds of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. And I hear the prophet Zechariah saying in chapter four, verse eight, do not despise the day of small things. Let's move forward. So inspiration continues to say, the germ in the seed grows by the unfolding of the life principle which God has implanted. Its development depends upon no human power. 
so it is with so it is with the kingdom of christ it is a new creation its principles of development are the opposite of those that rule the kingdoms of this world earthly governments prevail by physical force they maintain their dominion by war but the founder of the new kingdom is the prince of peace the holy spirit represents worldly kingdoms under the symbol of force sorry under the symbol of fierce beasts of prey. But Christ is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. In his plan of government, there is no employment of brute force to compel the conscience. The Jews looked for the kingdom of God to be established in the same way as the kingdoms of the world. To promote righteousness, they resorted to external measures. They devised methods and plans. But Christ implants a principle. By implanting truth and righteousness, he counterworks error and sin. So we see the, the difference between Christ's kingdom and the kingdoms of this world. Christ's kingdom is established in truth and righteousness, the principle of love and obedience. But the, the, the kingdoms of this world are by war and strife. Let's move forward. That reading came from Christ's Object Lesson 77.1. And we'll go forward and learn a bit more about this kingdom which Christ desires to set up beginning in our hearts. And it says again concerning the mustard seed, far and near, the mustard lifted itself above the grass and grain, waving its branches lightly in the air. Birds flitted from twig to twig and sang amid its leafy foliage. Yet the seed from, the, yet the seed from which sprang this giant plant was the least of all seeds. At first it had sent up a tender shoot, but it was of strong vitality and grew and flourished till it was of large proportions and the birds lodged on its shadow. The people look upon the mustard growing so vigorously about them and their minds are vividly impressed by the illustration Jesus has used to point the truth to, of his doctrine. He thus declares that not by force of arms and the pomp and heraldry of war, is the kingdom of Christ to be set up, but the work is of gradual development. Though the beginning may be small, it will grow and strengthen till, like the grain of mustard seed, it will reach through imperceptible stages of development, the majesty of greatness. And again, I remember Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6 saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord of hosts. So we'll go forward and see what more we can learn concerning the comparison of the mustard seed and the kingdom of God. So, inspiration continues. Jesus takes this poor little seed to illustrate his mighty truths. The merest trifle is not beneath the notice of the great teacher. Many were there whose Christian experience began that day and would be like the symbol he had used, growing into strength and beauty, trampled upon yet still maintaining its vigorous life. This figure was indelibly written upon the minds of hundreds who listened to the words of Jesus. Never would they behold the wrong growing mustard so plentiful in that region, but they would be reminded of this parable of the Savior and their hearts would remember the lesson that he taught concerning, concerning the mysterious influence of divine grace upon the human soul and the quickening power of the word that declares itself in the daily life. So as we had heard before, Christ used the natural things around to impress the truths upon the hearts of the people and so it is with us today as well. So not only is the growth of Christ's kingdom illustrated by the parable of the mustard seed, but in every stage of its growth, the experience represented in the parable is repeated. For his church in every generation, God has a special truth and a special work. The truth that is hid from the world, the wise and prudent, is revealed to the childlike and humble. So there we see those who were influential and of high authority, they despised the truth, but it was the poor, lowly people. Those who were sick and hungry, those who were maimed, even the thief, those were the ones who accepted the truth. 
So there's another lesson for us to learn. Let's move forward and get into that detail. Inspiration says, the great leaders of religious thought in this generation, not the generation of yesterday, but in this generation, sound the praises and build the monuments of those who planted the seed of truth centuries ago. Do not many turn from this work to trample down the growth springing from the same seed today. The old cries repeated, we know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, Christ in the messenger he sends. Of course, when Christ came, they said that about him. The Jewish people said that about Christ. But today's generation is, is saying the same thing about Christ's messengers of today. So they said, we know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. As in earlier ages, inspiration says, the special truths for this time are found where? Not with the ecclesiastical authorities. And that means the church leaders, the leaders of, yes, the, those, are, those who are in authority, the church leaders but with men and women who are not too learned or too wise to believe the word of God. And this is really very sad, but it is a profound truth that we need to understand. And I pray that we will contemplate these things carefully. For these lessons come to us, brethren, so that we may put on the divine nature, so that we may enter into eternal life and not lose out like the Jewish church. Inspiration continues, and in this last generation, the parable of the mustard seed is to reach a signal and triumphant fulfillment. The little seed will become a tree. The last message of warning and mercy is to go to every nation and kindred and tongue, take, to take out of them a people for his name, and the earth shall be lightened with his glory. I pray that you and I and all who listen will be a part of this great fulfillment. Let us strive to be amongst that people who shall give this final warning. We'll now move into Friday's lesson. Further thought, read Ellen G. White, the sower went forth to sow in the book Christ Object Lesson. In your spare time, please do that. We'll jump along to our final statement. There are some statements here that you can read, but I believe some of them we have already covered. So we'll go to our final, final statement before we close. And it says, in parables and comparisons, he found the best method of communicating divine truth. In simple language, using figures and illustrations drawn from the natural world, he opened spiritual truth to his hearers and gave expression to precious principles that would have passed from their minds and left scarcely a trace. Had he not connected his words with stirring scenes of life, experience, or nature? Let me read this again. He opened spiritual truth to his hearers and gave expression to precious principles that would have passed from their minds and left scarcely a trace, had he not connected his words with stirring scenes of life, experience, or nature. In this way, he called forth their interest, aroused inquiry, and when he had fully secured their attention, he decidedly impressed upon them the testimony of truth. In this way, he was able to make sufficient impression upon the heart, so that afterward his hearers could look upon the thing with which he connected his lesson, and recall the words of the divine teacher. Christ's method is to be our method. We who have the truth and are ministering it to others need to follow the pattern which Christ has set. I pray you have been blessed, brethren. Sister Cherry will give us our closing prayer as we go from Sabbath school. Thank you very much, Sister Aiken. Let us pray. Our kind and heavenly Father, we are truly thankful, Lord, for this opportunity that you have given us once again so that we can go to the Sabbath school lesson. Lord, you have kept us together. You have, been, you, have been, you have been with the internet service. You have been with our voices. You have helped us to explain things according to your will. And we ask in the Lord that you do not 
leave us here, that you go before us, go before our hearers, those who usually come by each and every week to be blessed by the Sabbath school lesson. May the blessing they came to receive indeed have fallen on their ears after they have fallen on those good grounds. Continue to be with us all we ask. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Bye from Sabbath school. We trust that you have been blessed. See you next time around, brethren. God bless you.